was hot, the queues were long, but more than 90% of Tunisians voted in the first free elections in their nation's history. Tunisia launched the Arab Spring. Will it now lead the way in Arab democracy? Good evening and welcome to The World This Week with me, Phil Rees. Thank you for joining us. Well, elderly people, some barely able to walk, young women in headscarves, students, shop workers, they all proudly displayed their ink-stained fingers as proof that they'd cast their ballots and taken part in a historic moment. But what will the high hopes that democracy brings actually lead to? And what kind of Tunisia will emerge? That's our first discussion. In part two, the King of Kings, Muammar Gaddafi, is dead. But will Libya follow the path of Tunisia? There are concerns after the grisly method of Gaddafi's killing, he was sodomized by a knife, was released on the internet. And the bodies of over 50 of his supporters were discovered in a hotel, all of them executed. Well, more on all that in 25 minutes. But first, Tunisia. A seasoned election observer from the Council of Europe, who uh, witnessed 50 elections around the world, said that he'd never seen a country able to realize such an election in a free, f fair and dignified way. Well, as the results trickle in, the Islamist Nata party, which means Renaissance, has won around 30 percent of the vote, but could win half of the seats in the Constituent Assembly. The three parties that have come out on top have no links with Tunisia's rich elite or the business leaders that benefited so much under the ousted dictator Ben Ali. Well, Nada's leaders say they have a moderate interpretation of Islamic law. We'll be discussing that. And the party supports religious freedom, they say, and won't touch Tunisia's family law, which in the 1950s abolished polygamy and gave women equal rights, including for divorce. Well, first, let's hear from Nina Arif. Final results should confirm victory in Tunisia's first ever free election for the Islamist and Nada party that appeared set to take power after the Arab Spring's first democratic test. An unexpectedly large number of voters turned out for Sunday's elections for a new 217-member assembly that will rewrite the constitution and form a caretaker government. And NADA leader Rashid Ghanouchi said a preliminary vote tally that put it in the clear lead with 53 seats of the polling districts counted so far made the party the natural choice to lead the new executive. Leftist parties may yet seek to form a majority bloc against Annada. The strength of Annada has divided Tunisians ever since the fall of former leader Ben Ali in January. To its supporters, it's an example of how balance can be struck between modernity and Islam. To its critics, a sign that resurgent religious politics could put Tunisia's secular tradition at risk. Mm, thank you, Nina. Well, to discuss this momentous election, I'm joined by Oliver McTernan the Distinguished Director of Forward Thinking, which works to facilitate dialogue and conflict resolution in the Middle East. We also have the Middle East Observer and online news editor, Mamoun Alabasi, and on the phone from Cambridge University, Abdul Wahib El Afendi, who studies democracy and Islam. Well, I'm so glad you can all join us. Um, Oliver McTernan, um, let me turn to you first. Now, it was no mean feat, was it, to put together complicated elections involving some 80 parties uh, of registered voters in a country that had been nearly a one-party state since its independence from France in 1956. What an achievement, huh? I think it's a remarkable achievement. And given the fact that Ben Ali ruled by dividing people, to see such a display of unity and such a response to this opportunity, I think is an encouraging sign for the future of Tunisia. Because opposition groups um, accepted the result, didn't they? They didn't really challenge it. There'd be no calls of, or very few calls of corruption, this kind of thing, which usually associates such polls. Yes, and you also feel that, you know, given the, as I say, very relatively short time they had to prepare for this, it's extraordinary how 90% of the population were able to get to the poll, and that was done in a proper way. Think back to our own elections, where people were complaining that they <laughs> couldn't get in on time and so forth. So it is quite remarkable and shows a remarkable maturity of the people. Mamoun al I mean, a lot of people talked about sort of Islam and democracy and, you know, this sort of are they compatible in all this? Well, here were Muslims. It's a 98, 99% Muslims who seem to uh, just love to go and vote in, in, in that system. 
Um, well, I, I think we shouldn't be surprised. If you look at opinion polls um, from much before the Arab Spring, they all indicate that the majority of Arabs see no contradiction whatsoever between Islam and uh, democracy. Um, one, one study, I think one of the biggest, Gallup one, what a billion uh, Muslims really think by um, John Esposito, Muna Mujahid, uh, said the, the same thing. So um, it's, it's no surprise that um, Arabs, or even in the Muslim world, don't see any contradiction. Um, I'd like to add that even the parties which are not Islamist as such, they are very proud of, 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 um, of their Arab and Muslim heritage. They just don't want um, um, religion to be part uh, of the political game. Maybe they don't want it to be demeaned as well. But even the, um, the, the uh, Musaf Marzouki, for example, who came, um, um, I think, second now in, in, in the polls, he's the head of the uh, conference for the Tunisian Republic. Um, he came out and said, OK, um, uh, my, I, I, my mother died and she's content in, with me. And I know that God is content with me. So it's, a, it's a, you know, across, I think, the majority of the Tunisian population are very proud in their faith and in their Arab identity, uh, regardless if they vote for something Islamist or not. Um, Abdul Wahab El Effendi, I mean, do you believe that when the Western discourse talks about Islam and democracy, they don't understand that, that these are nations, um, certainly Tunisia, where 98, 99% of the population are, are Muslim and they don't see any kind of, um, or they don't see the same kind of division between being secular and being Islamist? Well, I, I think the, uh, the Tunisian uh, situation is a bit unique in the sense that uh, the Islamist movement there has been actually a very uh, forward-thinking and looking uh, movement, which uh, many, many years ago, even before the Turkish experiment, had been uh, putting forward a rhetoric and discourse of uh, the compatibility of Islam and democracy. Uh, fortunately, also, uh, and ironically, uh, the, the secular character of the regime uh, and the way it has uh, tried to repress uh, the Islamists uh, has contributed, uh, in a sense, to this uh, democratic uh, progress because uh, by the way it has uh, alienated everybody, in the name of, first they tried to say the Islamists are a danger for democracy, and they tried to get around them the other secular groups, which worked for a while. But the secular groups soon uh, found that this is not going to work for them, and they uh, had a rapprochement with the, with the Islamists. So Tunis has been prepared for this uh, reconciliation of of, I don't say Islam and democracy, but Islamism and democracy, uh, through both the uh, thought and program of the Islamists and through the actions of the government. Okay, I mean, we, we want to talk more broadly about Islam um, and Islamism now in the, in the post sort of um, Arab Spring world um, in, in a minute. But, I mean, does this show there is no, there's, there's certainly no problem with Islamism and democracy, then is that? I mean, isn't this what you know speaks loudly in, in volumes from what happened on Sunday? Yes, I think so. I think the the, the the Arab societies as a whole have matured, and now they reconcile themselves to the reality. And democracy is a kind of conversation, and I think uh, the there has been a success in the conversation between various. Uh, sections of the Arab society, and the success actually of the Arab Revolution has been premised on this success of, di of dialogue. In Tunisia, uh, from 2005, there has been alliances including Islamists and, and, and secularist liberals, and in Egypt, through the movement of Kifaya, there has also been this alliance in 2005. Uh, so there was already the, 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 the formula which uh, has created the revolution is a formula which is now working uh, to, to create democracy. So I, I, but but can, I, can I just say that some of our viewers, um, Dr. El Effendi, would say actually that uh, there's no reason for a Muslim to actually accept 
democratic framework um, as offered by the West, that actually there is an alternative um, form of, 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 of shura, of dialogue, of consultation that Islam offer, offers. I mean, why should Islamist parties accept what is in effect a Western model of sort of one person, one vote? Well, I think the Islamists are, are themselves interpreters of what Islam uh, calls for. And through their own thinking and through their own experience, they have come to the conclusion that the, 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 some form of, of democratic institutions is the way to actually actualize the values of Islam, because all the alternatives are uh, either one-man rule or one-party rule, which uh, are not closer to the Islamic values than genuine democracy, which is actually, as I said, is a kind of conversation uh, of, of uh, compromise and agreement uh, ab among people from the same uh, a kind of... Uh, and I think they, they, it has proved true because the, uh, the democracy has shown that the people are actually, at large, the Muslim people, are more in favor of this kind of, is of moderate Islamism, which is, uh, tries to reconcile Islam and democracy. And, and that, I think, works both ways. Well, indeed. And I mean, I think now we come to the, the, the broader questions because, you know, many of these groups, and as we've heard, you know, after years of suppression, certainly members of the Nada party face that and the arrest of their members, um, and indeed their association with violence. I mean, Islamist parties are emerging um, as um, powerful forces in elections um, in the region. And most compare the Nata Party to Turkey's ruling justice and developing development party, I'm sorry, which has risen from Islamist environment, but accepts an essentially secular state, um, a trend that some have dubbed post-Islamist. In other words, they accept a Western democratic framework, but retain a legal system based on Islam. Well, one Tunisian writer said this week that his country had ignited the first spark for the Arab Spring, and is now igniting a second spark, the possibility of having modern Islamists in power in the region. Um, Oliver McTurdin, would you accept that? Yes, and I think that Tunisia is going to become the model for the other Arab countries. We often talk about Turkey being the model, but in fact, I think it will be Tunisia. Um, I have confidence that the Al Nada party will in fact, proved to be a worthy party of government. Um, we hosted here in London about four months ago the general secretary, who's likely to be the prime minister, um, Hamadi Jabeli. And, you know, I spent five days with him going around discussing his policy with the whole Guardian editorial team, the BBC, um, key presenters, editors, parliament. And he was with a secular judge. Both of them went together. And it was extraordinary, the consistency, the clarity, the vision they had then of how Tunisia should be. And that experience gave me confidence that there's been a lot of thought in this. Here are people who will not compromise their Islamic values, but will know how to live with a pluralism and govern with a pluralism. And I think they talk about <clears throat> government being neutral, and that is extremely important, that it gives space and room for everyone. And for me, that grows out of the fact that you mentioned earlier, the fact that most of these parties have spent 40, 50 years oppressed, tortured, and imprisoned. And from that suffering, I think they realize the need to allow people to have conscience and, and express their content. Because, of course, there are still, and, and, and as we know, for <laughs> viewers might know, that years of French colonialism d developed a, a certain caste in, in, in Tunisia that probably behaved and thought a lot like, you know, Frenchmen um, in that sense, and they believed in the laïcité, that is, mm. uh, secularism as a kind of ideology. Um, those voices were quite loud about, you know, claiming that Nada leaders were in doublespeak, they weren't really telling the truth. Yeah, the same accusations we saw been, get, being made against the AK party in Turkey were being made against Nada. And the, I think, problem is that some secularists um, have great difficulty in understanding religion per se, but Islam in particular. 
and therefore they're always suspicious that this is some sort of tactical move, you know, that it's a, a way of getting power and then imposing it. It was said in, in when Hamas won the, the elections in Gaza also. So I think it's up now to the El Nada party to prove, actually, you can have an Islamic party like the AK party in, in Turkey in power, deal with pluralism and govern in a way that respects the rights of all peoples. Do you accept that, uh, I mean? Um, I think, yeah, I, t I totally agree with Oliver. I think, especially in the case of Turkey, uh, under, under the uh, ruling party, um, Turkey has been closer in uh, observing human rights. Uh, for the first time, democracy has never been uh, so strong. Um, the impact of the military, which made four, um, overthrew four uh, democratic elected governments, it's, it's um, 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 given it its uh, limits. Um, the, um, they've given the Kurds, despite their still trouble, more than any other um, uh, party has given them. They want three straight wins with improvement in elections. And more women entered the assembly, the, the parliament, under the ticket of the ruling uh, Islamist party. But I just want to go back to the, to the idea of why would Muslims accept a Western-style democracy. Um, it sounds as if a Western-style democracy has been always like this mm. throughout the ages. Um, within Islam, there's always the element of renewal. So different interpretation across the ages saw different interpretations but of Islam. you know how, how explosive that issue is. So there but, are many but, groups but who today, do, do believe it. It's not actually... It's not it's straightforward, not, but no, it's democracy in Europe today is the same 50 years ago.